from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Frick. I'm the Director of Business Development at the Digital Public Library, and I've been working on a number of ebook initiatives with my colleague Michelle Bickard, who's our ebook program manager at DPLA. And we thought this would be a great opportunity here at DPLA Fest to bring up some folks who've been working really hard in the area of research and advocacy and ebooks that help us inform building really good, compelling services for our libraries and learn a little bit more about this. So we've got Michael Blackwell from Readers First, as well as Allison Bradley from the Charlotte Initiative. And then wrapping up everything is our colleague Colin Rogester from the White House, who's been um, helping us and facilitating the Open eBooks project. So as moderator, I'm going to just help with timing and moving our folks along. We'll have a time for maybe like one question in between each speakers, but if we can hold all of our questions towards the end, that'd be really great. So without further ado, Michael. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm Michael Blackwell from St. Mary's County Library and from Readers First. I've been Readers First for about three years. Readers First, the name says it all. I think we've got a reputation for being kind of a technical-oriented group and a large library-oriented group. Our real purpose is making reading easy for people. Reading is the most important part. So we're going to start with a little bit of trip back in time, back to about 2009, 2010, and this is what library ebooks were like. You probably all recognize some of these things. There's our friend Adobe Digital Editions, and there's a Nook. And what's the most important part of that nook? It's the plug. <laughs> because that's how you got ebooks on it from your library. You had to have that synchronized with an Adobe ID and Adobe Digital Edition synchronized with an ID. And if it didn't all work, you got an ACSM file sitting there that nobody knew anything what to do with. So, most of our users are probably not very sophisticated. And I was on the front lines then, and I often dealt with people sort of like the ones we see on the left here. Oh, my grandchildren gave me this e-reader. Can you show me how to get content on that, please? <laughs> and when you did, they gave you a hug, and it was a great experience. They were in the 21st century. They could go home and tell their grandkids, look what I did. But too often, what we saw instead is what you see on the right here. People who were very frustrated by that library ebook experience. This, incidentally, is not a frustrated user. This is a librarian. She was 24 years old when this picture was taken. <laughs> and this is what the stress of trying to teach ebooks at that time were doing to libraries. So she subsequently had a couple tours in Iraq and thought that was a much safer and better job. So ebooks should be easy. We want to take advantage of the benefits, that 24-7 access. It should be easy to get. Nobody comes to you and says, how do I open this book? And how do I turn the pages? So why should library ebooks be so tough? And that's where Readers First got its start. I call out a couple of folks, Micah May and James English and Michael Santangelo a couple of them in the audience here who were really instrumental in launching this movement. So currently we have about 300 libraries, about 200 million readers, and why not join? First, a word from our sponsor, Readers First, helping with library ebooks for four years. It's totally free. We have two ways you can join. You can either simply be a member and get updates, or you can join our working group. Either way, you make a huge difference on how library ebooks work. Thank you for this word from our sponsor. So, initial principles on this. We wanted to launch ebooks from the library catalog for ground libraries. We're the provider, not those vendors. Ebooks is not Overdrive, ebooks is your library. Manage accounts from the library site. You shouldn't have to go to all these separate places in order to manage your account. You ought to be able to do it right from the library site or the library app. And we want to make all vendor content interoperable. 
across platforms. You don't have to have this device and that limits what you can do or have this content bundled so that you've got to visit particular vendors to do that. And our initial way of approaching this was to develop APIs or to advocate the development of APIs. And finally, our aim was to try to develop and promote apps and create some standards for library ebook content so that the vendors would all say, all right, here's what we've got to do if we want to get into the library market. Now, we didn't approach this as if there were any devils. There's no demons out there. We wanted to say, you know, you're our friends. Who, who put that slide in there? Sarah, did you put that slide in there? Well, the gentleman on the left is Mr. Steve Potash from Overdrive, and he's actually been extremely pleasant to work with. I'll give you a specific example. If you go to your app now, you can log into Overdrive with your library card number. That was the reader's first idea we presented to them. So that's kind of how we work is we, what's a good idea? And we approach the vendors and talk about that. We say, we've got 200 million readers. Don't you want to work with us? Um, so that's not really fair to Steve, who's a stand-up guy. Uh, the guy on the right, um, Mr. Bezos, I believe that's actually a, an actual unretouched photo of him. <laughs> Funny thing happened. We announced our principles, got a website, started going to conferences, and all these groups started saying, we're readers first compliable. I said, really? Who are you? We had never even heard of you before. So our next step was to develop a guide to library ebook vendors. And we developed a matrix to do that, hence the picture from the matrix, which ranked vendors in about 37 categories, all of them weighted. And we came up with a sort of composite score to try to indicate how much these people were in compliance with readers first. And it was amazing to see the results we were interviewing most of the library vendors, and we also had contact with them through our libraries could actually evaluate their products. And a lot of them started developing things that we wanted just so they would be readers first compliant. And if you do ever access eBooks from your library catalog, and you're using APIs so that it launches right from that catalog, I'm not gonna take full credit for that for readers first, but I will say we did have a lot to do with that. Um, so then the golden period of library ebooks began. Print started shrinking, nobody got print anymore, everybody loved looking at ebooks because they were so easy. Yeah, right. So that brings us to the present. We still have a lot of concerns about library ebooks. Yes, they're, maybe most of the vendors are using APIs, it's gotten a lot easier to launch from your catalog, but we still look upon this process as being too fragmented. It's too necessary to go out to too many places and you're playing app soup when you're trying to get all libraries content. We want them all to launch from the single site. And the process, the very process of getting eBooks can get in the way and it's smaller and less affluent libraries this can be a particular problem because we may not have the money in order to do some of that API adoption in the catalogs. We're concerned about accessibility. Too often library ebooks are not accessible to those who might not see perfectly or have difficulty hearing. Privacy issues. Who owns the big data on library digital content and what do they do with it? If you know, please let me know because I have no idea. I know what they say they do. But there's a possible, I mean, we want to know it as libraries, but there's a possible revenue stream for them there that I'm not certain I want anybody to take advantage of. Preservation of ebooks. Who's keeping track of them? In 10 years, are we going to have access to them? Cost, this is a matter for the publishers primarily. Uh, I think everybody in this room is familiar with how much a new popular bestseller can cost as an ebook and how much that might compare to a print copy of the same thing. Finally, the business models that some publishers and vendors are using. Um, discovery of those titles can be very problematic. That one user, one book model definitely limits the number of books we can put into people's hands. When you couple that with prices, I think we're still doing our readers out there in libraries a real disservice. We've seen astronomical growth in library ebooks. What could it be if we had a workable model where people could access all the time or access more frequently than they do? How many more hits could we have? How many more readers could we have? 
another concern, ILL. Even if we've just got a license to something, why can't we let somebody else look at that? Now, there's a growing vendor market, and there's lots of newer library ebook vendors, and some of them are offering very interesting models. So that's a good thing, and competition is always nice, but it's presenting challenges too, because once again, we've got more people entering the market. How are we going to corral them? How are we going to get them working in a way that will support readers' first principles so we can launch all their stuff from the same place too? Finally, there's many, many voices in the library ebook. Oh, my 10 minutes, oh, I better hurry here. Um, so we're gonna rest really quickly here. Um, what are we doing at Readers First? Uh, first, keep calm and raise your standards. We are supporting the growth of standards that will work across vendor platforms. That's a huge thing for us, and it's probably gonna continue to be our main focus. We're going to release another version of our guide and try to give you some idea of how compliant folks are. We're looking for some marriages out here. The guy on the right is unfortunately not me with my shirt off. Um, I look a little bit more like the person on the left. Incidentally, if you've never seen the Library for Life and Style blog, it's a lot of fun. We want to reach out and work with other groups, and we think that the DPLA eBooks Working Group is going to be a fantastic resource for us. We do want to be apart from that. We want to share content with them. We want to share their content and work with other groups. And we're just introducing ourselves to the Charlotte Initiative you'll be hearing from in a minute. We'd love to be working with you. What can you do for ebook advocacy? Speak up, talk to your vendors, but more importantly, get involved with this conversation. Become a part. Join one of these groups. We are soliciting members, and it is totally free. Here are our principles, and I don't have time to review them in depth. OK. Um, make sure you're recognizing the library as provider. It shouldn't be, I access an ebook, who's OverDrive or who's 3M. It should be the library that you see. Easy to acquire and manage, no more than three clicks. Seamlessly available, available across all different platforms. Accessible, we need those filters, features built in private, and we need to formulate this lot much more, but how much information should be shared and who should it be shared with and what should the restrictions be? Um, and finally, provided by a business model which is beneficial to all. Authors, yes. Publishers, yes. It's not like we don't think people deserve a fair shake, but we think our readers deserve a fair shake too. Um, quick shout out for Kelvin Watson from Brooklyn. We were... Queens, I, I keep saying that. I'm sorry, Kelly, it's the third time I have done that. I, am, I will now bury my head in shame. I have shamed this cathedral of learning. Um, the silver lining from the hurricane that came through there was the development of some robust standards. We were talking to NISO for a while, kind of flirting with NISO. Now we think those might be used. A number of our colleagues from Readers First have been instrumental in developing the Simply E app. And if you don't know about that, please find everything you can about it and plan on becoming an adopter because it is going to revolutionize library ebooks. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Oh, any, any quick questions? Uh, we'll have a time at the end, too. Yes? Um, I'm told yes. <laughs> no. All right. Let's uh, let's find your presentation. Okay. Nope. Yes. Right. I've brought my own timer because otherwise, who knows how long I'll be talking for. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Allison Bradley. I'm the head of research and information services at UNC Charlotte, and I'm here today representing the Charlotte Initiative. Um, this is a Mellon-funded project that is designed to convene a group of publishers, librarians, and consortial representatives to talk about ways that we can collect ebooks and academic libraries for the long term. So, for a little bit of background, um, this project was really started. Um, several years ago, and it's based upon our library's assertive position on what we're willing to tolerate in ebook collections that we provide to our users. 
our first experiences with ebooks, well, it's probably similar to a lot of the other libraries out there. We had the Net Library collections about 10 years ago. Um, they were purchased by a statewide consortium. We were very excited when we got them. We promoted them really heavily, and our users gave us feedback hot and fresh. Uh, they were frustrated with the, the limitations on those collections. They didn't like the interface. They didn't understand why only one person could use the book at a time. Um, and in an academic library, they had been trained for 10 years prior to that to use online journals when anyone could look at a copy of any article at any time. They could download a PDF, they could take it with them, print it, save it, copy it, paste it. So when we came in and said, well, you know, the publishers are saying this ebook needs to work like a print book, they didn't really make that connection quite as, as easily as the, the, the publishers had hoped. Um, the particularly bad feedback came when our classroom um, instructors had a book that they either assigned or that their students all found at once that they all wanted to use. I think that the, the final straw for us was when we had a, a really nicely phrased but extremely angry email from a professor who said, if I knew that your ebooks worked like this, I would have told my students not to use the library at the beginning of the semester. So that's the kind of thing a librarian never wants to hear, right? That's, that's not what we're there for. Um, our, our associate university librarian for collection development, Chuck Hamaker, came to the subject librarian's next department meeting and said, hey, we've got 28,000 of these books. Can we just withdraw them? Can we take them out of the catalog? And that's probably the first time in recorded history that all of us agreed, right? There, there were absolutely no dissenting opinions. We were all happy to say, we'll throw them out and we will not provide them any longer because they just don't meet what a campus of our size and our type of research uh, needs. So, Chuck began writing and speaking pretty actively on his, his position on what sh a, a, an ebook collection needed to provide to serve an academic campus like ours. Um, he eventually drafted three basic principles of what we thought we needed to have in order to make these collections useful for our students and our faculty. Um, they're pretty simple. We think that our collections need to have unlimited simultaneous users. They need to have no digital rights management and they need to have irrevocable perpetual access and archival rights at the library level so that we can buy this stuff and keep it. Um, we see it as part of our responsibility to be able to hold on to the materials that we purchase for our students' research so that someone can go back in 50 years or 100 years, whether that material is out of date or not, and see how did we study that stuff back then. Um, in the fall of 2014, our library had the opportunity to pitch some different research ideas to a program officer from the Mellon Foundation's Scholarly Communications Program, and this was the one that he picked. So we were invited to develop a proposal on what we could do if they gave us some money related to these three principles. And what we came up with was to convene a working group, which I mentioned very briefly at the beginning. So, and spoiler alert, we were funded <laughs> to, to uh, convene a working group that consists of librarians from all different types of academic libraries across the country and also in Canada, uh, consortial representatives who purchase for statewide and regional consortia, and also publishers from university presses and nonprofit scholarly presses in particular. <laughs> so that we could talk about the potential that there is for ebooks to be provided to academic libraries um, meeting these principles, but also what kind of threats there might be to those university presses' business models, because they're frightened by um, these ideas. They think that this might actually be the thing that kills them. Um, we know that a lot of providers either aren't currently or are refusing to sell books that meet these principles, but we want to understand the ones that do, how they get past that fear, and how they get past the challenges that they see. Um, so the working group has about 25 members. We met in person last fall, and we've been having regular conference calls throughout the winter and the spring. We'll have another meeting this coming fall to discuss the high-level issues around these three principles. The second part of the grant is our research teams. We have four narrowly focused research teams that are addressing specific applications of this project. Uh, the first is the licensing principles team. They're studying publicly available licenses from scholarly presses on what they offer as their default conditions when they sell large ebook collections or ebooks individually to academic libraries. Uh, the course use research team addresses that, that angry professor's email. How can you buy these ebooks in a way that they make sense for classroom use? Um, 
The user experience research team is addressing the ways that our libraries assess how their users feel about eBooks. In particular, how much of our current research climate, um, you know, they'll do a study, they'll run a survey, and they'll say, oh, people feel X about eBooks. And they won't differentiate between um, whether that person is, is thinking of an OverDrive book they got from the public library, or a Springer title that they were able to download the complete PDF with one click, or um, something from ProQuest's uh, collection where each book can act differently <laughs> from one page to the next. It might be my least favorite. And finally, we have a platforms and preservation research team, which is addressing the ways that libraries themselves can make use of those archival rights that we've negotiated and who can, they can actually uh, both store and preserve content for the long term, but serve it on a single platform to their users, no matter what publisher that material came from. So the essential work of the project is to gather information. We're trying to get a sense of what's happening in the market right now, and also to start discussions so that we can better understand how this market is changing and how we can, frankly, promote the ideas that we think are really essential for eBooks to be useful in an academic library. Uh, the final remaining portion of the grant is a comprehensive environmental scan of the market, which is including uh, a literature review of what um, publishers are uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> a literature review, um, a survey of publishers to find out who is willing al or already offering uh, collections on the terms that we're suggesting, and also to find out for the publishers who aren't offering collections to these terms or who don't like the idea when we propose it, what's stopping them and what could we do to meet them halfway. And also just to review the current practices of libraries, how many of them are trying to uh, provide content to their users under these parameters and how many of them are not concerned as we are. And finally, each of the research teams will also be writing, publishing, and presenting on their findings, but also on the additional questions that are raised throughout the work of the grant. And we're anticipating that we will probably have more questions than answers at the end of this two years. Um, but the, the final portion of the grant is going to be an open conference that we'll be hosting in Charlotte in March of 2017. Each of the research teams will be reporting out on their findings. The working group will be reporting out on, well, anything that we've managed to uh, answer, but more likely most of the questions that we expect everyone to be facing together. It will be free and open to the public, and I hope that everyone will consider attending. Thanks so much, Rachel, for, for having me here today. Um, really excited to be here in the Library of Congress um, and talk about eBooks. And so just want to talk a little bit today about the Open eBooks initiative. Um, but before I delve into Open eBooks, I kind of want to back up a few years to where this all got started. Um, so <clears throat> the president in 2013 in June launched uh, an initiative called Connect Dead in Mooresville, North Carolina. Uh, the big goal of Connect Ed was kind of to yank our schools and libraries into to the 21st century and build the top uh, a lot of the innovation that has, had gone on the ed tech uh, sphere already and also uh, on uh, folks like the Digital Public Library of America have in libraries. Um, so the big goal of Connect Ed was to, is, is to connect 99% of students in schools and libraries by 2018 to high-speed broadband and Wi-Fi. Um, good news is we're on track to meet that goal. Already 20 million more students uh, as of last June have, have been connected. We'll see more data uh, in the fall on where we are now. Uh, but things are going well there. And it's not just about connectivity, though. The pillars of Connect Ed are connectivity, training teachers and librarians to be able to utilize the high-speed uh, Wi-Fi and technology, 
and uh, devices and quality digital content. Um, so the president challenged the FCC to step up and help us meet the connectivity goal. They changed, um, they did some E-rate modernization and uh, raised the cap on E-rate by 1.5 billion per year. Um, happy to say that it's, it's, it's going well and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have already gone out to schools and libraries. One quick, one change that was really important was uh, making Wi-Fi available for funding again. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of instances where schools and libraries have gone from you know, 10% connectivity in, in the buildings to 100% now today. Um, moving to training. Um, so in terms of training, we kind of address that with Future Ready. Um, so Future Ready is a kind of train the trainer, train the, train the teacher and uh, an educator type of thing. So uh, thousands of superintendents have committed to make their schools future ready and they have attended summits from around the country uh, to receive high quality professional development and also have a network of support um, and really excited that, that that was able to get off the ground. The Alliance for Excellent Education is a partner um, as well as uh, many library groups as well. Um, and so moving to the device side, uh, the president challenged uh, device makers to make devices uh, com price competitive with a textbook. And we have seen prices drop significantly over the past few years. Um, obviously some of that is Moore's Law, but also some of it is, uh, for example, Microsoft made a big connect uh, commitment where they cut um, essentially the, the Windows fee that would have gone into a computer out of the equation, so schools got about 100 bucks off every single device. And you've seen the device prices drive, uh, being driven down significantly, um, and you can get Chromebooks or other, other tablets for as cheap as $150 these days. So, um, and also Apple stepped up in a big way and committed $100 million worth of free iPads and other software to low-income schools, and those have already been rolled out um, in schools all across the country. So uh, the, the last piece is content. That's what we'll talk about today. So high quality digital content. Um, so in challenging the private sector, um, we, you know, we got a lot of different commitments on the device and connectivity side, but we hadn't, other than Safari books, uh, hadn't gotten a lot on the digital content front until about a year ago. Um, and that's when we worked with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which already had project, as you mentioned, Library Simplified, underway with New York Public Library, and uh, we were just thinking about how we could reach kids that, you know, don't buy books at home, don't have many uh, books at home, and, and provide them with a scalable solution that would allow them to have a world-class library at their fingertips. So working with Maura Marks, who's here today, um, you know, they, we, we util leveraged the grant that they already had with New York Public Library connected with um, the Digital Public Library of America, who is providing content curation and, and uh, a lot more uh, to the project, as well as First Book, who's providing authentication. Um, and Baker and Taylor is kind of serving the eBooks from, the, uh, from, from their servers to, to the students through, through the New York Public Library developed app. Um, so that's kind of the, the genesis of how it came together, working with Nancy Weiss um, in the Office of S Science and Technology Policy and many others in Domestic Policy Council. Um, and, and the partners kind of took this from, uh, from a nascent idea to a real thing. Um, and we were able to work with publishers to get thousands of ebooks donated. These are not, you know, just the bottom of the shelf ebooks. These are really top quality. You have things like Twilight. Uh, which you know the kids love apparently, and, um, and we recently added National Geographic. So there are a total of ten publishers, and um, you know, for example, Macmillan stepped up in a big way and gave all of their uh, age-appropriate titles uh, away to this project. And so um, that's just the start. I just want to talk a little bit about eligibility. Um, so first, this is the first book criteria of eligibility. Um, so in order to become a part of open ebooks, you have to join the first book networks. In order to join the first book network, you essentially have to serve low-income students or students in need. So 
Um, this reaches students in Title I schools, students in libraries that E-rate are above 90% um, percentage, and uh, federally, health, federally qualified health cares, USDA summer food service programs, uh, students that primarily are in special education classes or, or in pull out and push out, push in uh, situations, and then also schools that are on military bases or 70% or more of the students in a school are from military families. So a lot of eligibility. And just one quick um, note on this. Uh, you know, when we started, um, the, one of the qualifications is you're served by a homeless shelter. When we started, uh, when we started there was kind of some question about, um, you know, will these kids have devices at home? Uh, you know, there, there's low, low penetration. And, and that's true, at the time that we started, the percentage was lower, but recent data came out uh, showing that 85% of students and families um, with kids ages six to 13 have either a tablet or smartphone. And 90% uh, of smartphones or tablets can utilize open ebooks, so Android and uh, iOS. And so, um, what, what that basically means is that there's a huge proportion of, of kids out there that are eligible, and it's tens of millions. And um, one quick story, I was talking to a principal last week in, in Brooklyn who has a student that came up to her and said, uh, he's a homeless student, said that open ebooks has been a game changer for him. They had been sending home hard copy books to him, and he kind of moved from shelter to shelter, but the hard copy books were stolen often, and um, kind of counterintuitively, but the actually having a tablet is more safe, he said, because he can keep it on his person. And so the, he's, he's checked out a, 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 an e-reader and is able to uh, read at home with his, with his uh, family, and I'm really excited about that. So just wanted to give you a quick overview of what it looks like. This is what an iPhone view of um, what open e-books might look like. There are all different categories. Uh, should mention that DPLA has put together a fantastic curation core where they've um, gotten some of the nation's top librarians um, to basically take all of the books that the publishers uh, donated and have curated them into different swim lanes. You'll see here informational books. National Geographic was a recent uh, addition to the group. And uh, we really have tried to we, meaning the Curation Corps, have really tried to make sure that the books really matched the students that were reading it. So we've really tried to have a, as many diverse titles as possible. Um, they're encouraging publishers to give more. They have books in Spanish um, and are working towards having even more languages. Um, so this is just a quick look of what it looks like. Um, and I just noticed that, that New York Public Library is in here. Micah May has been spearheading it from New York Public Libraries standpoint and put together a fantastic app. Um, you'll see here that it's you know very slick. You've got a catalog, you've got a section of my books where you can store the, the books that are yours that you've already checked out. You click read, you return them when, you, when you're done. They're, the cool thing about this is that it's multi-use simultaneous. So um, you could return that Ashley Bryan book and decide, oh wait, I want to show it to my, my brother, check it right back out. So. Um, there, although there is a limit of 10, and the reason for that is the uh, teachers and other librarians have kind of thought it would be too much to have more than 10 at a time. Although there's a limit of 10, it's essentially unlimited. Um, so that is open ebooks. I uh, want to leave some time for questions, but really want to encourage you to either go yourself to openebooks.net and take advantage of it, or encourage your network to do so. We really think it's a great um, resource. and. We've actually seen incredible demand that's uh, gone way above the, our expectations. So thanks so much, and, and happy to take questions. Yes. Sure. No, I mean, and that's, that's 
definitely true. I think the what the partners wanted to do here is uh, provide a great resource to those kids that do have access to devices. So although you know they essentially didn't want to wait till there's 100% device penetration to move, and um, you know for kids like like the homeless student in Brooklyn um, who were able to check out an e-reader, this can be a huge plus to them. Um, I, I do would say that you know there's a lot of research showing that you know in 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 a v very few years we might be at 100% penetration, um, and uh, the New York Public Library is working uh, with their developers are working on a web-based version which should open it up even more. So just beyond beyond the Android and iOS, so that you could essentially have it on any device, any laptop, any computer. So that's a great question and something that, that we're certainly working on. Sure. Hey. Jump in here. I think you know. You're really good yeah, I could. I can't resist. You know, <laughs> kicking my butt forever. But I guess one thing that I've thought about a lot is I think that in the device lending space, um, it's very much a time of experimentation, right? We see uh, many schools going to one to one. We see other schools not. And, you know, within the New York City Department of Education, there is a wide variety of experiments being run um, and evaluation of those experiments. And I think one thing that has made sense to me, I mean. Part of it is just the financial factor, right? We don't have a magic wand to buy a vulnerable device. We couldn't do that. And we somehow created and discovered a magic wand to give everyone content, and that's pretty cool. Uh, but further than that, I think it, it makes sense in a way to start with content first. And if you have devices and you have nothing to put on them, which I think is sometimes a problem, right? Now we've got a device for every, every student in our school, but like literally, what do we put on it? And so in a way, you want to have the content solution there first while how devices are going to be provisioned is still a landscape of experimentation and a thousand flowers are blooming in that space so that all of those experiments can test and then give us feedback about how best to deliver the content. So if you're going to do one first, I think it makes sense to start with content. And I think we all very much agree that um, you know, getting devices on these things is still a challenge and something we need to collaborate to work on. And I would say there's a positive reinforcement there, right? If you're considering providing devices and there's nothing to put on them, it's not a very compelling case. If you're considering for devices and you say, and you can give every student this great you know, collection of eBooks along with other educational software, then it makes a lot more sense to make that investment. So hopefully having a content solution in place will actually help to drive positive device adoption. Do you think there's other you know, angles no, or no, questions we're missing? I'm not doing it in, in, in either camp, but I, the administrators in my organization um, are Republican librarians and they're already providing access to ebooks in some sense um, with, with, with or without a reader. Uh, having a reader to me or having a device may be more important, but I, I, I do see your point about the uh, content first solution. Sure. I mean, I think that um, the, the, the way we were able to make this work uh, with publishers was to have it go through the first book network. And um, so, you know, although we are working on a, a solution that, that all, all kids and all uh, families can access, right now uh, this, is, this is where we stand. And, and um, you know, I think it's a tough, tough message uh, to say, but essentially, you know, I think you can, if you're in a library, you can talk about all the library books that you have there available. I mean, this is certainly seen as a supplemental program that builds upon the top the great work that libraries have already had. Micah, do you want to jump in? I think in? I might have a punchy counter to that, which is, you know, libraries, I think, even, I mean, schools are used to giving some special benefits to low income, right? We have free lunch, there's Title One, it's very much done. Um, and libraries, we try really hard to say it's, it's equal and everyone has access to everything. And I guess there's a question, if you have the ability to give special access to a limited population, do you want to do that even though you can pay for everyone? And as a, 
bystanders who might ask you directly, say, hey, is there a different system? <coughs> if you have, you know, DMH can arrange it. A few of them call us at meetings. We get you with funding, we have your client, then say that community needs your donor funds. So do we not do that application because every branch can't have it? No, we take it where we can get it, right? And in some ways, this is analogous. If you have a resource that, and only in Washington, Washington, we give away the vote. So everyone has it across the region. So if you have a resource that's available to donate your income, just in the same way that you know we apply for rebate funding only for the branches that qualify, um, I would say that is a benefit to the library as a system and potentially you know allows us to reinvest more in serving those who don't qualify. There you go, yeah. Head start to yeah. realize that's where folks in the center of issues are of the listed kids in poverty, targeting those uh, kids who have a homeless background. So we've been doing that, and especially with the school targeted. But I just really wanted to hear yeah. what, what you'd say to that, because that was the main pushback I was getting. I think we all have a thing where we want to spark that lifetime love thing. Maybe we want to grow our universal leaders, and this is yet another tool in our toolkit that allows us to have a little bit more. And your question actually brought up, um, reminded me of something that's incredibly important as part of Connect Ed, which is the Connect Ed Library Challenge, uh, which IMLS is spearheading. Um, and that is essentially the idea of, you know, not every kid has a library card today. When I taught, we had to do a trip to the library, you know, rent a bus and all of that. Why, why can't we just have a kid, when they show up for school the first day, get a library card? Um, and so, you know, for example, in D.C., they, they made a commitment to the Connected Library Challenge. They went from about uh, 5,000 students to 70,000 students having library cards. So it's a huge jump. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, and I also wanted to mention two other initiatives, Connect Home and Connect All, that if you have questions about it, I'm happy to talk to after. Um, Connect All is something that's recently announced uh, by the president. Both of them uh, try to reach uh, kids at home to, to provide more uh, access to the internet, essentially, and uh, Connect Home is through uh, housing developments, and Connect All is essentially all Americans, so it's not necessarily just kids. And uh, it's it's kind of, we're working with a lot of different um, entities on that. One big change that, that kind of spurred this was the, the modernization of the Lifeline program, which will now allow 
uh, low-income Americans to use the Lifeline for broadband. Last question. What is the status of the connected library challenge that a month ago, the working group was able to get a new policy to try and roll it out again rapidly and increase the number of young voices heard? So we said, hey, we want to try the connected library connected challenge and got either back, okay, that's great, but we're kind of in a holding pattern right now because so many people recently wanted to join and so many are really like the new staff. Okay, well, I, I think we should definitely follow up with you if, if you haven't heard back yet. Um, the uh, ULC is working with IMLS on, on kind of uh, supporting folks that want to make the, the pledge. And um, what we've had today, to date, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids have gotten library cards. Um, we're gathering the data from librarians to all across the country to try to aggregate that. Um, Nancy Weiss is here. Do you want to, do you want to yeah, comment to that? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.